Uh, I want to introduce our speaker, because he'll come right up after the choir has sung. Uh, Dr. Mark Nelson is the Monroe Professor of Philosophy here at Westmont College. Uh, someone I've uh, long wanted to have in chapel. Uh, every time I talk to Mark, I walk away glad that I had spoken with him, and every time I've heard him speak, I have thought, gee, we need to hear more from Mark. Uh, I love Mark Nelson for a lot of things, but I think the biggest thing is that, is that his intellect, uh, which is considerable, has been pressed into the service of love. So, Mark, we uh, await what you have to share with us after the choir sings. Thank you, Ben, for that introduction, and thank you, Laura, for reading that passage from John 12. Today I'm going to talk about that passage, but also about the philosophy of existentialism. In particular, I'm going to talk about the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, who is considered one of the founders of existentialism. But before I do that, we need to get a couple of things out of the way. The first is pronunciation. In English, I know it looks like it ought to be Kierkegaard, but in Danish it's pronounced Kierkegaard and I want to practice it with you. So, repeat after me. Kier. Kier. Ka. Ka. Gore. Gore. Put them together. Kierkegore. Kierkegore. You're speaking Danish already. The second thing is, this talk is not really intended for all of you. Let me explain. I think you can divide the world into two groups. In fact, you can divide the world into two groups along many different lines. Uh, and some of these divisions run pretty deep. But I don't mean just divisions like Democrat versus Republican or Calvinist versus Arminian. I mean the deep divisions. Dodgers fans versus Giants fans. <laughs> Page Hall versus Clark Hall. Notre Dame fans versus SC fans. Perverts who squeeze the toothpaste from the middle of the tube <laughs> versus the righteous, kind, wise people who squeeze it from the end, flattening the tube as they go up. The really deep divisions. Now, one of these deep divisions has to do with your outlook on life. I say that in your outlook on life, you are either a cat or a dog. Now, I don't mean a cat lover versus dog lover. That's another recognizable division, a deep one, along the lines of Dodgers versus Giants. I mean something different. Um, these are people I'm talking about. What I'm calling a cat is a person whose very existence is somehow fundamentally problematic for them. <laughs> what I... What I'm calling a dog, on the other hand, is a person for whom their existence is not especially problematic. Uh, there are some other differences. Dogs, people, uh, are pack animals. They're extroverted. They're trusting. Cats, on the other hand, are solitary. They're introverted. They're skeptical or cynical. With dogs, what you see is what you get. But with cat people, they have sides that no one else knows about. But the main difference is this. For dogs, life itself is not problematic, but for cats, it is. I'm not talking about just the difference between sad and happy. There are, after all, some miserable and starving dogs. <laughs> but what I'm calling cats are people for whom life does not make sense, or whose identity or history or relationships have a cloud over them, or who are looking for something even when they aren't sure what it is, or for whom the future just looks like more empty time. Now let me ask you, do you recognize this distinction I am trying to draw? Do you know people who fit in these categories? I think I do. I don't want to exaggerate the distinction. Not everybody perfectly fits into one category or the other, and, and the classifications might change over time. Even if you start out as a dog, you might have a cat phase. <clears throat> anyway, I mention all this because my talk today is intended for the cats among you, especially the ones who feel as if they are the lone cat 
in a college full of dogs. I'm talking mainly to them. Uh, but the rest of you mutts are, of course, free to listen in. <laughs> I also mention this because Soren Kierkegaard was definitely a cat writing for other cats. Now, most of you probably don't know much about Kierkegaard, so let me give you a little background. He was born in 1813, died in 1855. He lived his whole life in Denmark, left only for a few trips to Germany and Sweden. In some ways, his life went very well, at least on paper. He was born into affluence. He was highly educated and intelligent. In Denmark, he was one of the leading literary figures of the day and is still considered one of the prose masters of the Danish language. And he is also one of the greatest philosophic geniuses of the modern era. But in other ways, his life did not go very well. He was born weak and sickly and slightly deformed. He was raised in a household of stifling religiosity by a father who believed he had been cursed by God for some unnameable sin. Kierkegaard rebelled against this father while in university, and he rejected Christianity. He lived a dissolute life, getting drunk, spending his father's money, running up debts, visiting a brothel. He famously had troubled relationships with women, including an infatuation that led to an engagement, which he felt he couldn't go forward with, and which he broke in a really clumsy and disgraceful way. He got into a fight with one of the main magazines of the day, and he lost. He was caricatured and lampooned mercilessly. Cartoonists mocked his curved spine, among other things. At this time, he said, he couldn't leave his house without getting jeered in the street. He described it as being like trampled to death by geese. He wrote a lot, but was mostly misunderstood in his lifetime. He once wrote in his journal, people understand me so little that they do not even understand when I complain of being misunderstood. <laughs> he died at the age of 42. So his life did not always go very well. Along the way, though, he returned to the Christian faith and wrote volumes about it. His central concern was the solitary individual before God. He wanted people to be Christians, not just bland, absent-minded, once-a-week churchgoers, but passionate Christians who had chosen Christianity because they believed it and had a real relationship with God. He held that for each person, their main task in life was to become their true self in relation to God. And this is why Kierkegaard is called an existentialist. He thinks philosophers should spend less time trying to come up with abstract rational systems and more time addressing existing individuals and the problems they live with. So mostly he wrote about what it's like to be a real live individual, one who feels like they are swimming out on an ocean, as he put it, suspended over 70,000 fathoms. That's hard enough, but he believed something else that made it harder. Kierkegaard believed that if you just tell people the truth directly, they won't necessarily believe it. They may nod their heads politely and say, yeah, that's probably true. Uh, they may even think they agree, but they won't really believe it because when it comes to important things, believing something means really taking hold of it yourself because you've chosen it. So he held that a writer has to approach people indirectly. Sometimes you tell it to them straight, but other times you reverse, use reverse psychology and say the opposite of what you think. He used irony extensively, and he often wrote under pseudonyms, pretending to be two or three different people at once, arguing different points against each other. He did this to force his readers to decide for themselves where they stood, to take responsibility for their beliefs and choices. As you can imagine, this makes interpreting Kierkegaard rather difficult. He's a notoriously slippery customer, and he knew this. He knew that most people would not get him. But he wrote many hundreds of pages in the hopes that here or there, 
he would get through to even just one person. In fact, he dedicated several of his books to that solitary individual. In my view, Soren Kierkegaard was a cat, maybe the ultimate cat. Now this raises an interesting question. If Kierkegaard was what I'm calling a cat, what about Jesus? Was he a cat or a dog? Now this is a freighted question, I'm sure you will have strong opinions. The truth of the matter is, I don't know. But what I do know is that Jesus had a heart for all sorts of people. And I think he had a special heart for cats. And the scriptures tell us that he spoke to the mystery and loneliness and solitary costs that cats bear, but which can lead to life in the end. And I know he does this in our scripture passage for today. So let's turn back to John 12. <clears throat> that is such a rich passage, but I'm going to focus on one small part of it. Verse 32, where Jesus says, But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Even this single verse is fuller than we can fathom today. Whole books could be written about it. So let me offer only a few observations. In it, Jesus is talking about his own impending crucifixion. He is also likening his death to an earlier event in the history of his people, the story of the bronze snake in Numbers 21. Recall that during their wilderness years, the children of Israel complained against the Lord. It says in the scripture, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. The Lord then sends venomous snakes among them, they bite the people, and many Israelites die. The Israelites repent and ask Moses to pray for them, so he does. And the Lord says to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten at it, bitten, can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then, when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. So, do you see what is happening in John 12, 32? Jesus is comparing himself to a snake on a pole. The snake, a repulsive thing, an unclean thing, was lifted on high, and astonishingly, everyone who came to it and looked at it was healed. In the same way, Jesus says, he will be crucified, lifted up from this earth, and equally astonishingly, anyone who comes to him will also be healed of sin and guilt and meaninglessness. Now how that happens is another story, but for now all I will say is this just is the gospel. And it is one of those points that Kierkegaard reveled in, how things that seem so paradoxical, so contrary to the wisdom of the world, so different from how we would do things if we were in charge, nevertheless turn out to be true. That the leader must be a servant, that to save your life you must lose it, that something as repulsive and unclean as a crucifixion is also the source of life and health. But that's not the main connection between John 12, 32 and Kierkegaard. The main connection is this. Kierkegaard loved this passage. I said a moment ago that whole books could be written about it. In fact, Kierkegaard did more or less that. In 1851, he published a book called Training in Christianity, the largest part of which is a collection of seven meditations on that verse, John 12:32. But there's nothing slippery about Kierkegaard's writing here. He's writing as a Christian for other Christians. He did write it under a pseudonym, but only because he felt he lacked the spiritual authority to speak these words in his own person. The seventh and concluding meditation is an extended prayer based on this verse. And I would like to share some of that prayer with you today. It's a tender-hearted, generous prayer. 
in which Kierkegaard prays for every kind of person that there is. I won't read it all because um, his desire to cover it means that it's a, 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 a lengthy piece. I hope you'll read the whole thing sometime, but here's the part I would like to share with you for today. Perhaps you'll recognize yourself in one or more of the categories he names. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, whether we be far off or near, far away from you in the human swarm, in business, in earthly cares, in temporal joys, in merely human highness, or far from all this, forsaken, unappreciated, in loneliness, and in this all the nearer to you, draw us, draw us entirely to yourself. Unto you, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you will draw us entirely to yourself. Whether our life shall be passed calmly in a cottage by a tranquil lake, or we shall be tried by conflict with life's storms upon the troubled ocean, whether we shall seek for honor by living quietly or shall struggle in loneliness, please draw us and draw us entirely unto yourself. If only you will draw us, then indeed all is one, even though humanly speaking, we win nothing. And nothing is lost, even though humanly speaking, we win everything, we lose everything. You who called yourself the way, you have more ways than there are stars in heaven, ways everywhere, ways which lead to the way. We pray for those who have experienced that which in an earthly sense is the most beautiful meaning of this earthly life, those who in love have found one another. We pray for lovers that they may not promise to one another more that they can do or be. And even if they could be or do all those things, that they may not promise one another too much in love, in case this love of theirs might become a barrier to hinder you from drawing them unto yourself. We pray for all, for him who at this instant first hails the light of day, that the meaning of his life may be that he is drawn unto you. And we pray for the dying, for the one who has much and many to hold her back, and for the one who has nothing and nobody who cares. We pray that it may have been the meaning of all their lives to be drawn unto you. We pray for the happy and the fortunate who are so full of joy that they do not know where they are going, that you will draw them unto yourself and let them learn that it is there they should go. We pray for the sufferers who in their wretchedness do not know where to turn, that you will draw them unto yourself, that both the fortunate ones and the sufferers, however unlike their lot in life, may in one thing be alike, that they know nowhere else to go but to you. Thus we pray for all. Now that's Kierkegaard's prayer, a bit of it that I wanted to share with you. I love the fact and I find it moving that Kierkegaard, melancholy, introverted, intellectual Kierkegaard, the ultimate cat, could compose such a tender-hearted prayer, a prayer for every sort of person that they would be drawn to Jesus. And notice, his prayer is not only that they will be drawn to Jesus, but that it will be the meaning of their lives that they are drawn to Jesus. Now, <clears throat> this got me wondering, how exactly does being drawn to Jesus provide meaning in a person's life? In my thinking about this theological and philosophical question, I found help from an unexpected quarter, namely natural science. And an interesting conversation I had a couple of years ago with our own Professor Warren Rogers of the physics department. It was a conversation about the physics of, of gravitation. Think of that simplest example of gravitation, the apple falling from the tree. We are told that both apple and earth 
are pulling at each other. Each is drawing the other toward its center of gravity. So when the apple falls, it is being pulled toward the center of the earth, and it stops only when the surface of the earth gets in the way. That's what it is to fall, to be pulled toward a center of gravity. Also, when the moon orbits the earth, that also is because of gravity. And, Professor Rogers told me, this also is a sort of falling. The moon is tumbling toward the surface of the earth, but because the earth is spherical, the earth's surface is dropping away from the moon at more or less the same rate that the moon is falling toward it. That's why it orbits. It's falling in a circle. All of this got me wondering, could it be that when Jesus is lifted up and he draws people to himself, that this is somehow analogous to gravity? And I wondered, does it make sense to say that we can fall toward God? I really liked that idea, but it seemed like my own private theory. In fact, it wasn't even a theory so much as just an image. Uh, I wondered if this imagery had ever occurred to anyone else. So I was really pleased to find a clear example of it in a book by a little old lady in Minnesota. That book is called Bright Valley of Love by Mrs. Edna Hong. In Bright Valley of Love, Mrs. Hong tells the true story of Gunther, a highly intelligent but physically disabled boy who was born in Germany in 1914. Gunther's story turns out happy in the end, but its beginning was not at all happy. He too was born sickly and deformed to a mother who immediately abandoned him and his father. Gunther's father went away to look for work during the Weimar Republic, so for the first six years of his life, Gunther lived alone with his impoverished grandmother. The grandmother fed him thin soup twice a day, but she bitterly resented having to do it, and so she would never speak to him except to scold him for being worthless. His bones were so badly deformed from rickets that he could barely move, and he spent most of every day alone in cold, wet diapers, staring up at the ceiling in the back bedroom of his grandmother's dingy flat. By the age of six, Gunther had not really learned to speak, because no one had ever spoken to him, except for the occasional scoldings. When the grandmother couldn't take it anymore, she and his father abandoned Gunther at Bethel, a care home for the epileptic and mentally disabled run by German Christians uh, near Bielefeld. Anyway, this book, Bright Valley of Love, is simply the story of Gunther's life in the Bethel community. It's an exciting, moving story, and if you read it, you would learn how Gunther learned to speak and even walk, how he became a deacon and a personal assistant to the leaders of Bethel, how Nazi eugenicists pressured the leaders of Bethel to hand over their children for extermination and how those leaders stood up to the Nazis and saved the children. But all I can tell you about today <clears throat> is what happened when Gunther first encountered people who loved him, who cared for him, who spoke to him. Mrs. Hong's description here is wonderful, so I'm going to quote her at length. She writes, until he came to Bethel, Time for Gunther had been a fog that stayed on and on and never lifted. No red-letter days. Sunday was no different from Monday. The half-gloom of one day slipped through the gloom of night into the half-gloom of another day. Time merely went on from nothing to nothing. No periods, no commas, no question marks, no exclamation marks. Nothing to remember, nothing to look forward to, except for the next bowl of gray potato soup. It was his third day at Bethel. There had been a profusion and confusion of sensations, some fearful ones, such as the strange cries that rang out when a child had an epileptic attack. But mostly, the sensations were glad ones, trumpeting awake all that dully slept in him, mouths that said his name again and again, Gunther, you have a name. 
Your name is Gunther. Eyes that look directly and deeply into his own eyes. And the rough, wet tongue of a baby calf had tickled the strange sound of laughter from his throat. But so far, all these were simply bright new pictures in the flow of time. Today, however, was Sunday, so they told him. <clears throat> Before this Sunday was over, a most beautiful thing happened to Gunther. Time stopped flowing on endlessly. Time went into orbit around a light and a brightness that somehow explained all the bright pictures that had suddenly bobbed up in his life. All the bright pictures went into orbit too. For Gunther, time found a center that Sunday. The misshapen little planet that was Gunther began orbiting around that center. In a wave, there fluttered over the boy a dim and jumbled but wildly wonderful realization of the possibility of life that he was not a piece of human garbage carried along on a gray and endless tide of time. He could be. Time was for being. Time was for becoming. Time was for becoming what he could be. Later she adds, in a way it can be said that for Gunther, that first Sunday in August 1921 was a self-sighting day. In another way, it can be said that for him, eternity entered into time on that day. From that day on, Gunther's self began to be drawn in a steady curve around a center. So do you see what she's, what she's suggesting? That as Gunther is drawn to the Lord, he goes into a kind of orbit. And an orbiting body no longer drifts aimlessly through empty space and time. The orbit gives shape and meaning to time itself, because only orbiting bodies have days and months and years. I was really delighted to find this passage that illustrated and confirmed my Kierkegaardian idea, but I have a little confession to make here. It was not just a lucky coincidence that I found this, this imagery in that book, because that little old lady from Minnesota was in fact one half of an internationally distinguished husband and wife team of scholars. Howard and Edna Hong of St. Olaf College, who shared as their life's work the translation and dissemination of the work of Soren Kierkegaard. Now, I've run out of time, so I need to conclude. Let me do so by adding to Kierkegaard's prayer a prayer of my own for you here today. <clears throat> Unto you, Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for the blessed, the beautiful, and the lucky, those for whom everything seems to go right, who fit in effortlessly and are full of energy. I pray that they will be drawn to you, the source of all beauty and goodness and energy. Equally, I pray for those who do not feel blessed, who do not fit in, who hate their bodies or the way they look, who cannot feel happy and do not know why, who are struggling to make sense of their sexuality, who live in half gloom, who have always felt adrift. I pray that despite all of these things, or indeed in all of these things, you will be lifted up, and that as you are lifted up, you will pull them so strongly to yourself that they will stop drifting and go into orbit around you, that this orbit will give shape and meaning to their time, that their time will be for becoming their true selves. And finally, I pray for that solitary individual, the one who has always felt like the lone cat in a world of dogs, that it may be the meaning of her life or his life to be drawn to you. And I pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>